Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Happy New Year. My name is Marion, and I'm the chair of Audubon Chapter of Minneapolis. I hope that you are all cozy and warm. What a perfect night to uh, hunker down and reflect on and learn about birds in winter and the boreal ecosystems of the north. Um, our chapter is very proud to offer these free public webinars to the public, um, thanks to generous do donations. Uh, if you've been enjoying our programs, we invite you to consider becoming a member or making a donation. I will post um, the donation link in our chat. And um, we will have hopefully some time for question and answers. Um, if you have a question throughout the program, you can enter it. I see that many of you already found the Q&A box uh, to let me know the chat was disabled. So you can also use that for any questions you have for our uh, presenter. Um, and tonight I am very happy and honored to introduce our presenter, Clinton Dexter Nyenhaus. He is the head of naturalist for Friends of Sac Zimbog. He's an environmental educator with a master's degree in environmental education a bachelor's degree in environmental biology. And as head naturalist for Friends of Saxon Bog, Clinton leads educational field trips in the bog, uh, teaches master naturalist courses, serves as a bird guide, coordinates a number of citizen science endeavors and documents and identifies all the floral and fauna found in Saxon Bog. His interests in the natural world include fish, dragonflies, dams damselflies, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, moths, and butterflies, lichens, prairie, and boreal forest plant communities, and ecology, as well as um, ants and grasshoppers. So um, without further ado, I will turn the mic over to Clinton and um, hope you enjoy our program. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, and thanks so much, everybody, for, for tuning in. Um, feel free to keep using the chat and the Q&A for questions. Um, we can take them in bits and pieces as we go along, um, or we can take them all at the end, no problem um, to me. Um, and so sort of as was introduced, I, 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 we're in winter right now. And so uh, what I would like to do is sort of introduce um, everybody to not just the bog, but um, the things that we have here, and especially what the heck they're doing in the winter, um, we'll certainly cover a little bit of um, background about the place. If you're not familiar, that's totally okay. We'll run through a bunch of that stuff uh, as we go. Um, so first things first, um, we're going to talk about the place. Um, the Saxon Bog is a place. It's not sort of a um, a, a mysterious kind of word you keep hearing all over the uh, all over. Um, it is a place, so we'll talk about what it is and kind of what makes the bog the bog. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the organization as well. Um, so I know sometimes we have a lot of organizational bits and pieces that we want to figure out, and I'm happy to talk about some of those as we go. Uh, but uh, the kind of the big focus is these birds, and especially the birds in the winter. Um, not to say that we won't talk about some summer things as well, um, uh, but I, I'm really curious to, to, to see what the heck is going on with some of these birds in the winter. Uh, and so very simply, what is the Saxon bog, right? Um, well, it's, it's, a, it's an ecosystem. It's a, it's a landscape. Um, and if we start very simply from the beginning, um, we think about the Saxon bog important bird area. Um, this is a, 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 an important bird area, if you're not familiar, are areas that are designated by Audubon and by BirdLife International um, as places that have very specific or sensitive or rare or declining things, whether that's habitat types, um, whether it's birds, whether it's places that have uh, an increased conservation need for one reason or the other. Um, and those two organizations go through and say, this little section here is something we should consider as an important bird area, um, maybe to help steer conservation, to help steer um, decisions that get made on that landscape. Uh, and so for us, the Saxon Bog Important Bird Area is defined as 147,000 acres. Um, so it's a pretty big place. It's kind of a tall and skinny section um, that we'll look at a map here in just a second. Um, but for our organization, for the Friends of Saxon Bog, um, we like to include the bits and pieces that are outside of that initial designation. So there are some 
pieces of habitat that might be west of that original designation or east of that original designation. Um, and so we include maybe double that, 250 to 300,000 acres um, are included in what we have defined as the Saxon bog um, and the greater Saxon bog ecosystem. Um, because habitat's habitat, even if it's, you know, a foot across the arbitrary line, it doesn't really matter. The birds still use it, the bugs still use it, the plants still use it, um, and it's still important. So we like to consider that. Um, and so if we do look at the map, um, you can see Duluth's down there in your lower right-hand corner, um, and that area that's outlined in orange, um, that is the Saxon Bog important bird area. Um, so if you've heard Saxon bog, this is what people usually refer to. Um, most of the time when folks visit the bog, um, you're kind of over here in this northwestern section, uh, maybe a good third or more of the whole place, um, but maybe only hit two or three spots while you're here. So it's a really huge area. Um, I don't expect many people to be down on the south end at all when they're visiting. And if we zoom that out to include that greater Saxon bog, um, you can see we've added a whole bunch of stuff to the west side, a little bit on the east, a little bit on the south, and a little bit on the north end. Um, because again, that habitat is still important. It is still valuable habitat for the creatures that are here, um, the creatures that use it during the winter and beyond. Um, and so we, as an organization, again, try to include all of those bits and pieces that make this area important. Um, this area also is sort of a, a rough approximation, or at least um, gives kind of a, a, a better boundary when we think about how this area was formed, um, and we think about the glacial lake that created the Saxon bog and all of the different landforms that are here. Um, generally, that uh, glacial lake ran from the northeast side down to the southwest side. Um, if you have more questions about that, I'm happy to answer them, um, but we won't dig into it too much more um, for the purposes of our talk today. Uh, and when you're in the bog, um, you may be surprised to see this. Um, this is not bog. Uh, this is upland conifer forest. Uh, but part of the landscape of the Saxon bog is made up of bits and pieces of other habitat types, not just bog. Um, we, we like to call it a, a magic mix of habitats. There's a lot going on here. Um, part of that glacial history means there's some sand. Um, some sand from the, you know, the movement of the glaciers across landscape, and it gets deposited in these big eskers, and we end up with jack pine, and we end up with red pine and white pine and sand, um, something you might not expect if you're thinking about a wetland, um, because um, Saxon bog is a major complex of wetlands. Um, so we definitely have this, which means we have very specific species that use that habitat type which contrasts very greatly with this. Um, when we say bog in our area, this is kind of what we're talking about. Um, more of a lowland conifer forest type bog where there's a lot of trees, um, there's a lot of kind of closed canopy, not a lot of open understory um, in a lot of the bog that's in the Saxon bog, but we do have the same cast of characters you might expect in a bog. Black spruce and tamarack and Labrador tea and leather leaf and bog rosemary uh, bog laurel, all of these species that are very much specialized to live in bogs. Um, and so when you come visit the bog, you hopefully might think of tundra type bogs and ecosystems as what bog could be. Um, but this is what bog can be as well. Um, and for our purposes, this is what our bogs look like in this part of Minnesota. Uh, but in the Saxon bog, like I said, there's more. There's more going on ecosystem wise. Um, some of that is riverine forest and very southern species creeping up very far north. Um, you think about trees like basswood and cottonwoods, um, they're not very common the further north you get, um, but we do have some along the St. Louis River, along the Whiteface River, um, which sort of border the Saxon bog on the east and the west. Um, this is the Whiteface River from a, an aerial view at our Wood Thrush Woods property. Um, and you can see it's mixed forest. It's pretty typical northern boreal forest. Um, there's some balsam fir and there's some maples and there's some aspen um, all mixed into this nice mosaic um, that, no surprise, holds its own suite of species. And we haven't even talked about water yet. Uh, we've got the St. Louis River, we've got the Whiteface River, and we've got all these little streams and creeks that meander through the Saxon bog um, that make part of this um, landscape. Um, really quite lovely to explore kind of uh, on, on the water, if you will. Um, bogs in and of themselves aren't always terribly wet, 
Um, and so much of the water in the region is confined to those basins of the Whiteface River and the St. Louis River, um, as well as the lakes that are in the area. And, and the kind of the weird thing about the bog is that a lot of the lakes are in the northeast side of the bog, um, kind of the, the place where the lakes drained from. Um, when Glacial Lake Upham was drained, it drained from the northeast to the southwest, creating the St. Louis River and the Cloquet Rivers. Um, and so you end up with remnants of that uh, movement on the northeast side of things. Um, pretty typical northern Minnesota lakes. If you spend some time in, in northern Minnesota or even up into Canada, a lot of very dark water, a lot of wild rice, um, lovely, lovely places to spend some time. Um, but there's one other habitat type that we shouldn't forget about, and it's it's sort of a manufactured habitat type, right? It's agricultural fields. It's hay fields and pasture lands um, that support a lot of different species, um, not just agricultural animals, um, but birds like snowy owls and rough-legged hawks and northern shrikes. Um, they love these wide open spaces um, because that's what they're used to. Um, that's what they're used to on their breeding grounds. And when they come south, um, they don't really like the forest. They, they don't really know what to do with it. And so they come down and find these open fields uh, and spend a little time before moving on or maybe spending all winter um, in those places. In the summer, those the agricultural fields turn into mini prairies, basically, right? You've got species like bobolink, um, you've got sedrens and leconte sparrow, um, savanna sparrows, very typical grassland species in this area as well because of the habitat's there, um, which is really, really quite fun um, and quite cool. It makes, makes things really interesting in the summertime. Uh, and when we think about the name of this place, um, that's probably the easiest part of the name is Sax and Zim, uh, because um, Sax and Zim were both towns. Pretty simple. They were both named uh, after people um, who were first to come into this area. Um, they don't really exist as much anymore. Um, Sachs, you can't really even tell there was a, a town there. Um, with Zim, at least there's still the post office and there's a few houses around that intersection. So it feels a little bit like um, uh, some folks live out there. But this was an area that was kind of sparsely populated because of the railroads that were moving up and down from the Iron Range to Duluth. Um, both of these towns were right smack dab on the railroad tracks, um, picking people up, moving people up and down um, uh, from the Iron Range to Duluth um, as industry. And as industry got better, there wasn't really the same amount of need for some of that movement. Um, and so um, they kind of went away with a lot of small little towns in northern Minnesota. Um, but when we think about the other part of that name, Saxon Bog, um, the bog piece can sometimes be a little tricky to define. Um, so first, we're going to look at a comic. We're going to go into this in a lighthearted fashion. Um, this is one of the best summations I've seen as, as far as taking a humorous approach to this. This is from Bird and Moon Comics. Um, and a lot of people, even folks who grew up in this area, um, do think that bogs are kind of gross and kind of stinky and scary and, and gloopy. Um, but that really isn't the case. Um, bogs are really sensitive ecosystems. They hold a lot of really specialized creatures, um, whether that's plants or whether it's bugs. Um, they can be quite sensitive to disturbance, whether that's from our feet uh, or from water tables changing um, or things getting a little too warm. Um, and so they are really quite a specialized set of habitats. And so we'll kind of dig into a little bit more about what bogs are, because I think that will help us um, as we go ahead further and talk about the birds and the, the, the adaptation some of these things have. Uh, and so bogs very simply are a wetland, right? A wetland is a huge umbrella of different habitat types um, that could look like this. Um, this is where uh, I grew up in southern Minnesota. Our wetlands look like this, cattail marshes with open water that transitions to emergent vegetation, that transitions to shrubby stuff, and then that transitions into trees. So very regular um, kind of cascade of, of, of a habitat as it goes from wet to drier. Uh, but uh, a very common ecosystem type where we are is this. Um, this is an alder swamp. Um, and, and swamps are a wetland, but they're a little bit different than a marsh. Um, and so you can see here, there's a lot of um, shrubs and then kind of surrounded and bordered by trees. So swamps usually have a, a water kind of matrix throughout all of the, the woody plants. And it's usually a little too wet for larger plants or larger trees to grow. So typically 
you have swamps that are edged in taller trees and then it opens up, um, especially with alder swamps. Um, the shrubs that are growing there can tolerate some wetness and so they can, they're very happy being wet, they're very happy being dry, um, and you end up with an ecosystem that looks like this. We have a lot of this in the Saxon bog, um, especially along the Highway 7 corridor, along the south end of Admiral Road, there's a bunch of it. Uh, and it doesn't harbor as much life in the winter as it does in the summer, um, which I think is an important note to make about that habitat because it is, there is a lot of it, but it's pretty much uh, a barren or slow moving here in the winter time. Um, and then we can think about this. And so I mentioned maybe this is what a bog looks like to you, and, and that's fine because it could be. Um, but this is more typical of, of a fen, at least in northern Minnesota, and fens and bogs are very close to one another. Um, we can look at water chemistry, we can look at plants that are there, maybe some indicator species will stick out as major differences between bogs and fens. Um, but for the most part, if you kind of look at the understory here, um, we're dealing with a lot of grasses and sedges and um, not a lot of shrubby stuff going on in the understory. Um, little islands of trees are pretty typical. Um, and this is from the Toivola Swamp, which is uh, in the Saxon bog on the west, west side of the bog. Um, could this be a bog? Yeah, it's pretty close. There's, there's very few differences up here. Um, in the southern part of the state where we have a little more limestone, we tend to get much more basic fens. Uh, and that's the really easy way to define a fen in a bog is just by looking at the water. Um, and like I said, our bogs tend to look a little more like this. They, they're more maybe correctly classified as a lowland conifer forest, but they still have sphagnum moss in the understory. Um, any shrubs that they have are going to be highly specialized, like our bog rosemaries and our Labrador teas and leather leaf and all that. Uh, and usually they're pretty dense up here, and, and that is sort of to the benefit of a lot of the species that um, live in this habitat type. Um, they might want that tight, dense canopy. Birds like boreal chickadee uh, really love a dense canopy in a forest like this. And so, um, again, this is kind of what our bogs look like. Sometimes we do get some openings, and there are a whole different suite of characters that can be found in those open sections of, of habitat like this. Um, which is really cool. Um, but when you think about bog and you think about the Saxon bog, um, this is kind of what we're what we're talking about, what we're thinking about um, in, in kind of consideration of the birds and the other creatures that are here. Uh, and the last thing we'll say about bogs, again, just to give you just a smidge more about what a bog does and how it is. Um, I mentioned there isn't a lot of water in a bog. Um, and there certainly is water, uh, but that is not water on top of things. If you can kind of see, this is how a bog forms and how a bog grows. Um, and they really do grow. Um, they typically have covered a depression in their life um, or are working to cover that small lake um, or a little uh, wet spot in the forest um, where the bog and the sphagnum moss is growing out and dying and kind of piling itself up until it has totally covered uh, that section. If there's water in a bog, typically it's moving across it. So on top of it or adjacent to it, it's not part of the matrix of a bog. Um, again, make some really, really interesting places when you think about how water tables work and all that. Um, so with any of those background pieces, if there's any questions, I'll, I'll invite you to put them into the Q&A and into the chat. Um, I'm gonna get a little drink of water um, and then I think we'll move on and take our questions at the end. Because I do have some time for questions uh, at the end and, I, and I'm uh, very curious to see what you all have to say. So let's move on to the organization, uh, a little bit more about us and the things that we do in this place. Uh, because like I said, it is, an, it is a pretty broad and pretty large ecosystem. So how do we function as an organization here? Um, well, very simply, we're, we're working to be kind of a voice to this place. Um, so we are a, a 501c3 nonprofit. We were established in 2010 um, by Sparky and Dave and Kim, um, kind of in response to some things that they were seeing going on with the forest in the area, especially with the black spruce and the tamarack. Um, both of those trees are really critical, important critically important to a lot of the species that are in this place um, and to sort of to the overall function of the ecosystem. Um, and so um, they got together and started the Friends of Saxon Bog kind of to be that um, voice or the figurehead or at least the, the, the folks who might be interested in doing some conservation work in this area. Um, and that was sort of the initial impetus of the Friends was to be a land conservation organization, um, which we still definitely do. Um, 
but we've added a few more things. We, we've added some outreach pieces and some research pieces and some um, general communication with folks who live here or visit here or love the things that we're doing. Um, uh, and again, part of that was uh, in sort of response to especially black spruce logging and the increases of it in the area. Um, so this is a kind of an old aerial photo from 1992. Um, and the area of interest uh, is sort of um, on this left side of the screen. This is the Toivola Swamp, at least part of the Toivola Swamp. Um, it is a pretty unbroken stretch of bog that covers a lot of ground. Um, Highway 5 is kind of in the middle of your screen, but pay attention to kind of this area that I'm circling here. Uh, because a few years later, this was in place. This was from 2003, uh, and this is a peat mine. Um, peat mines aren't terribly common anymore, um, but peat does get used um, in a lot of different applications. It gets used um, in horticulture. It gets used in herpetoculture. Um, it is uh, kind of an important moisture retaining uh, facet of soil mixes. So if you do a lot of gardening, um, you're probably using peat to some degree. Um, and it has to come from somewhere. Um, and in our area, it comes from two different places, from the Toivola Swamp here, uh, and then on the south end of the bog, um, County Road 8, there's another peat mine. Both of them aren't terribly active. They are active. But um, this is a bit of an issue for a bog, right? If, if we want to see uh, this ecosystem succeed and we want to see the, the plants and the bugs and everything do what they're supposed to be doing, um, this level of disturbance is not great. Um, that section of that uh, habitat is probably never going to recover. Um, once it dries out, it gets really, really, really dry. Um, and it also gets incredibly flammable. So bogs will burn for a very long time um, if they are disturbed like this, um, which is, again, not a great, not a great thing. Certainly the forests in this part of the state could use a fire every now and then, um, but not to the scale that could potentially happen. Um, from a place like this. Um, luckily, that's not happened. And we're probably never going to have to worry about that. But um, it is a consideration to make um, because, you know, the peat comes from somewhere. Um, but the bigger thing for us was the, the response to an increase in the logging of black spruce and tamarack. Um, so this is something that I've been able to see even since I've started working with the friends. Um, this is my eighth winter um, in, in things here. Uh, highway 53 is right down the middle. Um, 133, Highway 133 is on your, on your kind of bottom left-hand side. Um, and this is from 2011. Um, and just a couple of years later, 2017, you can see all of those chunks that are going away. Um, not all of that's black spruce and tamarack, but most of it is. Um, and that's a little bit of a problem um, in, in kind of the, the terms of the ecosystem. Um, and our organization is not against logging by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we know that we are in Minnesota and we do a very good job with forestry practices in the state. Um, we also know that it's part of the economy up here. Um, our goal is that we can find these places and just um, pick them up a lot faster than maybe they can get cut. Uh, but the reason we wanna do that is because these forests take a really long time to regenerate. Um, just to put it in perspective, and we'll see it in the next slide, Aspen, um, you can log Aspen in 35 to 40 year rotations. Um, with black spruce and tamarack, it's around 80 to 120 years, um, which is a very, very, very long time. Um, they're very slow growing trees, and typically um, the largest trees are the most important for the ecosystem. Um, and so, you know, some of these trees that we'll see every day in the bog are, you know, 80 to 100 years old or more. Um, and they've taken that long to grow, even, you know, um, a couple inches in diameter. So um, this is sort of uh, not what we would hope to see on the, on the landscape. Um, Aspen is a whole other story, right? So this is a big chunk of Aspen off of McDavitt Road. Um, and you can see now it's totally gone. But this was an aerial view from 2015. That forest is probably perfect age for golden wing warblers right now. Golden wing warblers and veeries, American woodcock. There are a lot of species that like that regenerative aspen. Um, and so, like I said, Minnesota does a pretty good job of understanding how to use its resources responsibly. Um, and the forests are one of those resources that, again, we, we kind of do use pretty well. Um, but again, this is going to be ready to go in, you know, 30 years more, um, where that Black spruce and tamarack that we just saw is going to take 70, 80 more years. Um, so again, there's some trade-offs. And again, we don't want to lose all the aspen either because there are a lot of species that want to use the aspen. Northern goshawks, um, woodpeckers love nesting in aspen, rough grouse love aspen quite a bit. 
Um, and so again, we want to be responsible in this place. And as an organization, we hope to find these places and help preserve them um, as best we can. Uh, and we've done a pretty good job of that, I think, so far. Um, we've been able to pick up over 4,200 acres uh, as we as we sit here today, uh, which is great. Um, we've got at least one other project that's kind of been in the works for the last few years and is getting hung up by a few different things. Um, that 4,200 acres is across eight properties um, with two more wilderness type properties. Um, those properties being places we're probably not going to put any trails ever, probably not going to put any boardwalks ever. Um, and in one instance, uh, the biggest chunk of land that we own, um, we we can't. Uh, part of the, the land agreement there um, was part of the wetland bank that was put in. Um, and that property chunk can't really be, be tampered with in perpetuity, which is great. Um, perfect for what we want to do with it. Um, and so we're, we're happy to see it um, continue to, to be bog. Uh, and then last is the Welcome Center, of course. Um, the Welcome Center property is kind of a, a unique setup um, where we've, we've leased it from St. Louis County, the area around the Welcome Center, um, uh, but that will hopefully be coming to us um, in our next land acquisition. So um, we get land in a few different ways. Some of it is through um, land that gets donated to us. Some of it is through land that we seek out and we buy. Some of it we pick up from land grants. Um, uh, and so there's a lot of different ways we can do that. If you're interested, happy to happy to talk about that. Um, and our properties are, are pretty variable in size, but for the most part, um, focus on bog habitats. We've got basically just one property that is something other than bog, um, which is pretty cool. Um, the nice thing for us as a nonprofit is that bog and, and wetlands in general are, are pretty cheap to come by because there's not a lot of value other than the trees in them. Um, which is great. Again, if you're a nonprofit, that's the perfect thing you want to hear. Cheap land is great. Where I grew up in southern Minnesota, um, definitely not the case. Uh, 40 acre sections might go for close to a million dollars in, in farm country. So um, we can spend less than 500 an acre on most of the properties and, and do pretty well for ourselves. Um, yellow bellied bog, I just have a, a photo here because all these maps are on our website. If you're interested in looking at our properties or figuring out where you want to, you know, snowshoe or, or get on a trail. Um, all those are on the website. Um, I've got some information there on the upper left of your screen to talk about what you can do there or what can be done there, which is really, really nice. Um, not all of our properties um, have trails, like I said, um, but where they do, we've got them marked with GPS, um, but we've also got some boardwalks on some of our properties. Um, our properties range in size from 26 acres um, all the way up to 120 acres. Um, excluding the 3,200 that is the, the big chunk that we've just picked up from the wetland bank. Uh, and boardwalks are one of the kind of the newer additions to some of our properties. Right now we've got four boardwalks in the bog. Uh, most of them are pretty short. This is at uh, Augie's Boardwalk uh, up at French Gentian Bog. Um, it's only maybe 250, 300 feet long. Um, the Warren Wussner Bog Boardwalk at Warren Nelson Bog was our first boardwalk, and that one's got a little side spur of about 150 feet, and it goes about 900 feet into the bog. Um, we have another bog at, or another boardwalk at Winterberry Bog, the Bob Russell Memorial Boardwalk. Um, that is the only boardwalk that is a loop, um, so you can go through the bog and loop yourself back around to the boardwalk. It's also a really interesting research area too. Uh, and then we just finished part of the way of a boardwalk that's at the Welcome Center, the John C. Gale Boardwalk, um, which basically connects the trails from the Welcome Center to Gray Jay Way, um, which is gonna be a really lovely one. Um, and for me as an educator, boardwalks are super important. Um, they are something that I use a lot uh, because we all can't navigate bogs in the same way. Um, and so uh, part of the, the benefit to having a boardwalk is that we're not disturbing that ecosystem terribly. We're going to disturb it maybe once, and then we're going to be set up for the future. We don't have to disturb it again. Um, but it also means that I can get everybody out into a bog and to see what some of these trees are and to see what that moss looks like um, without too much difficulty at all, um, which is absolutely lovely. Um, and so um, hopefully we'll be able to, to finish that boardwalk behind the Welcome Center um, and add a couple more here and there. Um, it's something that uh, we like, like to try to do in this place because um, we would like to encourage everybody, no matter their ability, to get into the bog. 
Uh, where we don't have boardwalks, all of our trails are marked um, with a marker at the trailhead. We've got loops marked. We've got uh, directional arrows back to where you came from marked. Um, so it's a pretty easy place to get off trail and, and kind of stay on trail in, in some places. Um, there's uh, multiple multitudes of ownership in the bog. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, public land, but there's a lot of private land. And it's very hard to know what's what. Um, and so... Um, it's very nice that we have these properties that have trails on them, um, but know that we do have other suggestions if people do want to do some bushwhacking. Um, there's lots of county land. There's wildlife management areas in the bog. Um, it really is a, a quite a diverse landscape when we think about ownership. If you have questions about that stuff, happy to take them as well. Uh, and more or less, this is everybody. Um, kind of in this L shape from the left side. Sarah is our new development director. Um, there I am in the, the top middle and there's Sparky, our executive director. Um, and that's it for full-time staff. It's just the three of us. Um, everybody else here are our board members. Um, all the board members are all volunteer, um, which is really, really great. Um, and they help kind of steer the things that we wanna do in this place and in the area and, and make sure that we're doing the things that we're, we're saying we're doing, which is really uh, a good a good team of folks here. Um, and we just added four new staff um, this winter. Uh, all of our uh, other staff are seasonal. So winter season, summer season. Um, uh, and we're so happy to have four new folks to help figure out how we can use our new addition to the Welcome Center. Uh, the Lewis King Education Center is where this photo was taken. Um, if you've not been up or if it's been a while since you've been to the bog, um, um, the tiny little building is still there, but it is connected to this wonderful education space. Um, and these four folks are helping us welcome folks to the bog. Um, these seasonal positions hopefully will carry over to the summer. Um, primarily, our season is, you know, December to March. Um, but the last couple of years, we've been open um, in June until August. And I think we'll continue to do that uh, moving ahead. So come in the winter, but also come in the summer. Um, it's There's a lot to do. And there's a lot going on all the time. Um, but that's three full-time staff and maybe four additional staff, but we also get a lot of help from volunteers and without volunteers, we really can't do much. Um, all the board is volunteer. Um, the folks who are not staff working at the Welcome Center, um, those are all volunteers, people who are coming out to share their time and their excitement um, with this about this place with the people who are visiting. Um, when we talk about some citizen science things um, for Kestrel monitoring project, I've got a whole slew of volunteers. Um, that four to five is a is a pretty low number. I think we're up to a dozen folks now um, working on monitoring uh, for our Kestrel program. Um, and then I, I put citizen scientists on here because um, I use iNaturalist a lot. Um, and there are a lot of folks who do use iNaturalist quite a bit when they are in the bog. And I appreciate the efforts people do just reporting the things that they're seeing. Um, it helps me kind of maintain and keep and update our list um, or locations where we might find certain species. Uh, and ultimately without volunteers and without our members, we can't really do what we're hoping to do. Um, almost all of the, the budgeting stuff that we get in a season, all the funding is coming from memberships primarily. Um, we'll occasionally chase around grants for land acquisitions, uh, but we really don't do that as far as um, other payroll things or all that goes. Um, and we're not necessarily a membership organization either. So anybody who donates at least $25 in a season, um, we include as a member. We're not going to send you a thing that says, hey, please be a member at this rate or this level. Um, that's just the way sort of we do things, which is uh, a pretty fun way to do it, I think. Um, and it's really important. It's really important to what we can do. And, and all the members that we have are, uh, are really willing to share time and expertise and um, funds in some cases, right, uh, to help support the things that we're doing. Um, we're not a terribly large organization as far as that goes either. We might have around 1,500 folks who donate in a season, maybe more, maybe less. Uh, maybe some of those folks might just donate once and then be done. Um, so it's a, it's a really um, kind of variable number for us, which, is, which has worked out all right so far. Um, and our members really do come to the call. Uh, this is from one of our fundraising galas um, when we, we were still doing those early on. Um, 
all these folks are here spending some time because they're interested in the things that we're doing and they want to know how did they, they can support us. Um, sometimes it is through monetary contributions. Sometimes it's just simply attending and, and reaching out to a friend to say, hey, this is what these folks are doing. That's pretty cool. Um, that word of mouth is so valuable to, to our organization and to a lot of nonprofits um, in the world. Um, but also these members are out doing work, right? Um, they're out in the bogs with us putting out material for the boardwalks, building the boardwalks. Um, certainly we have uh, uh, you know, paid folks to do a lot of some of this heavy lifting, but a lot of the boardwalks, if you've been to the bog and you've walked on them, um, almost all of that's done under volunteer power, which is amazing. It's one of the, the coolest things I think about um, our organization is that we have such a strong volunteer base and folks who are uh, quite willing to, to put out you know, the blood, sweat, and tears to, to help us um, put in a boardwalk and kind of do the things that we want to do in this space. So without volunteers, without membership, um, we really couldn't do the things that we're doing, even in terms of research, right? Um, so I mentioned a little bit about the Kestrel program. Um, it's our kind of our longest running um, citizen science effort, if you will. Um, but we've been able to now with our organization growing and, and kind of moving and, and trying out new things, we've been able to support um, research too um, by, you know, buying transmitters for Northern Hawk Owl research or, or Northern Shrike research. Um, we got a paper published uh, about mosses in the bog um, because we had folks who were really interested in mosses. And so we said, sure. Um, and so we're we're kind of dipping our toes in the waters of, of the research side of things nowadays, um, which is kind of fun. Um, certainly a new visitor center takes a lot of work, at, at, you know, and, and figuring out how we can utilize the space. But um, hopefully we can do some more of these kind of fun um, um, things as well and help at least facilitate research in this place because it is big and it's not ours. Um, we just might have some of the expertise people need to help uh, get projects complete. Uh, so a whole bunch of things to think about there. If you've got questions, go ahead, type them in. Like I said, we'll um, take our time at the end here to address them. Um, but I do really appreciate it. I, I see some questions going in right now um, and that's really, really great. Um, I'm gonna take another sip of water. and shuffle a little bit and then we're going to keep going so so far we've covered uh kind of about the area we've covered a little bit about the organization um and so let's answer this question let's kind of figure out why why is this place important why is there an organization that's working on land preservation here um because it is a big place and we don't own the whole thing right we only own 4200 acres or, or so in this 147,000 plus acre landscape um so why are we doing that work? Well, um, pretty simply because there's a lot going on. We certainly get known uh, from the bird side of things and, and rightfully so. We're gonna talk a whole lot about birds here in the next couple of minutes, um, but it's more than just that, at least from my perspective, right? As an educator and as somebody who wants to show everybody what makes this place so cool. Um, we've documented over 3000 species in the bog. Um, that's from plants uh, across the board through to fish and mammals and um, dipping our toes into uh, some weird insect things. And um, it's it's come a, a heck of a long way since I started with a list of um, a little bit under 900 species, I think was the first official species list. Um, and we've been growing and growing and growing from there. And it's not gonna stop anytime soon, which is great. Uh, but my per, my my kind of uh, uh, goal here as as a head naturalist is to document some of that stuff and learn about it, but also then teach about it. Um, so I do a lot of education programming. Um, spring and summer, winter seasons were kind of the historical, you know, on seasons for me. But now we're wrapping things up into full year round programming, expanding into kind of our shoulder seasons a little bit. Um, and most of that's through long kind of uh, duration field trips or specific events and workshops. Um, definitely, it's not a, an easy place to get to. And so we want to make sure that when folks are here, we really spend time in that system and talk about some things. Um, I do master naturalist stuff too. I, I'm a certified uh, master naturalist instructor. And so I've done a lot of advanced training work. I just taught my first 40-hour uh, course um, this last fall, and I'm super excited to do more in this new building. 
Uh, but it's more than just that, right? It's more than just these field trips and these uh, opportunities, but it's recreation, right? Of all kinds. There's people who come to just take photos. There's people who just come to bird. There's people who come to ski and to snowshoe. There's folks who are kayaking in the summers. Um, there's folks that are riding their bikes through the bog. Um, there's a lot and there's a lot for everybody um, in this place. So if you might not be interested in birds, but maybe uh, fungi are, are your thing that's here you know there's lots of places that you can go look and find some really cool stuff uh, and so know that there's recreation of all kinds in this place um, and you know we do our best to kind of keep those opportunities in mind for folks um, our visitorship definitely has grown um, this was from a couple of years ago we were around about 4,400 visitors a winter um, I think we're probably closer to to five or six thousand now um, which is great um, certainly warrants a, a new space, certainly warrants um, some sort of uh, further considerations organizationally, but um, less so in the summer, um, certainly not zero, right? Because there are people who are interested in the butterflies and the dragonflies and the orchids um, and a lot of these really cool bog specialists that you can only really see when it's warm out. Um, but with the Welcome Center being open, it'll take a couple of years, I think, before everybody realizes that we are open in the summer, um, which is all right, because mosquitoes uh, are the other consideration to make. Uh, we, we like to think about mosquitoes in a negative sense here, but without mosquitoes, we don't have a lot of the birds that we have, because that's a huge food source for a lot of these species. Um, but really the bird that put us on the map and, and put this whole area on the map, uh, besides the northern hawk owl, is this bird, is great gray owl. Um, for us, this is a resident. Uh, great grays are here all the time. Um, they just so happen to be a little bit easier to see during the winter than they are in the summer. Um, and so that's why we have our visitorship so high in the wintertime. Um, certainly cold is something to contend with, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But um, this bird got us a little bit more national attention in the winter 2004 and 2005. Um, There's a really huge great gray owl eruption in Minnesota. Um, there were at least 5,000 different great grays in the state of Minnesota that winter, um, which is way more than actually are here year round. Um, and so this pretty massive flight got some um, publicity out with the New York Times, um, and then that sort of garnered some national attention um, way back then, um, which was really kind of cool, and which is why you could be in Florida and see somebody with a Saxon bog hat on, uh, because they know about this place, which is really awesome. Um, but this is the bird. Uh, we're going to talk more about them, but largest owl in North America, um, Saxon bog just so happens to be one of the easiest places to, to find one um, in the lower 48 and maybe even um, in, in the U.S. Uh, proper. Uh, but we do offer a lot to wintering species. Um, pine grosbeaks are not a breeder in Minnesota. They breed in the Rockies in the lower 48, or they breed up in far northern Canada, up into Alaska. Uh, but this is a species that we see basically every year um, because we have the habitat and the things that they want. Um, we have boreal forests, which is what they're comfortable with and they're familiar with which also means we have all the food sources that they're familiar with, whether it's um, viburnums uh, or maples or ash or spruce, um, they've, they've got it. Bird feeders also help, right? But um, they would come down here anyways. It's a pocket of really lovely habitat that is familiar to a lot of really far Northern species, especially finches. Um, so white wing crossbills um, are fairly regular for us. Um, it is a species that does kind of breed in Minnesota, but not every year. Um, same thing with uh, bird like pine siskin. Um, pine siskins are in the bog in the summer. Sometimes they're here all winter, but sometimes they are moving around looking for more food too. Um, so a lot of winter finch interest in the in the winter time, and that's only in the winter time. Um, so much so that a bird like uh, pine grosbeak um, typically leaves around the first week of March, uh, almost like clockwork. They're gone. Um, certainly some other finches linger, but pine grosbeaks really get out of dodge um, to get back uh, north to breed every year. Um, in the summertime, though, we also have birds, right? It's not just a winter thing. Um, in the summer, we have way more birds around than we do in the wintertime. Um, 20 species in a day in the winter might be really good. Uh, but in the summer, we've got maybe 120 species that nest. And so you can pretty easily do 100 species in a day um, in, in peak breeding season, which is amazing. Um, one of those birds that gets a lot of visitors here is this bird, this is Connecticut warbler. Um, they are a bog, uh, bog bird. Um, they are a bird that's been declining pretty steadily for the last uh, maybe 20, 30 years. Um, they've been losing habitat in their wintering grounds. They've been losing habitat in their breeding grounds. Um, it's a bird that really has very specific needs 
um, for its breeding. And so um, we have a lot of them because we have a lot of really nice intact habitat here in the bog. So we're happy to have them. Uh, one of about 21 species of warbler that nest in the bog, um, which is really great. A lot of food, which means we got a lot of birds, especially insect eating birds. Um, a bird you might be surprised to hear that's in the bog is this bird, another sort of rare bird um, that maybe is making a bit of an in, in increase is wood thrush. Uh, so not do we just have these bog specialist things like great grays and black back woodpecker and boreal chickadee, uh, but we have some deciduous forest birds like wood thrush and great crested flycatcher and um, some of these species you might not expect in a bog. Um, but we have them and it's nice to have them. We have a property that, that has a whole bunch of wood thrushes on it, which is really, really great. Uh, and part of the reason that we picked up the property as we did uh, to help support this bird as well. Uh, but a lot of those bog species, uh, you know, are only here a little bit of the time, right? So we want to try and keep those breeding habitats in good shape. Uh, birds like yellow-bellied flycatcher, like this one here, might not get a heck of a lot of attention, um, but they're really important all the same. Um, they are an insect eater, and that's why a lot of these birds come back to the bog and come back to Minnesota. Um, it's because there's so much food for them to successfully raise those young uh, and then get back down to South America. Um, a lot of these birds don't arrive until the middle of May to the beginning of June, um, and they leave during the end of August into September, and so they're only here a couple of months, um, but we still um, enjoy their, their presence when they're here in the woods and in the bugs, uh, because it, it really without that and without these birds, this place would be totally different. So maybe a little taste of summer. I'm still thinking about winter though. We're, we're here in January and we're getting more snow. So let's talk about the winter. Um, winter in the bog can be a little intimidating, I think. Um, it can be pretty cold. Um, we're routinely among the coldest places in the lower 48. Um, in the last couple of years, we've hit um, at least 45 below or colder. Um, so 45 below zero is nothing to be trifled with. Um, with the wind, we've hit up to 60 below, which is, again, pretty cold. Um, it's not always that cold, so if you're worried about visiting because it's cold, nah, don't worry too much about it. Um, month of January tends to be our coldest month. Um, we sit right around zero almost every day in the morning, uh, maybe a little colder. Um, but the roads are pretty well taken care of. Being in a, in a wilderness area like we are, um, it can be kind of difficult to know what to expect. Um, but we are in kind of the middle point of the county where um, the, the border of the northern St. Louis and southern St. Louis counties are right at cotton. And so we get really good road care, which is, which is nice. It's a benefit to having a lot of people out and about, but also making uh, those roads uh, in, in good shape is also pretty cool. Uh, but there are some considerations we should make, right? A lot of this ecosystem really needs winter. So if we think about do birds need winter? Well, sort of, because the ecosystem sort of does. Um, a lot of the trees you find in the boreal forest are really specially adapted to the winter. Um, these are all black spruce. And if you can see, they're totally covered in snow. Um, our first really big snowfall of the winter came a, a few days before the Christmas bird count. Um, and that was about 28 to 30 inches of really wet, heavy snow. Um, Certainly there were some trees that broke, um, but a lot of these spruces are pretty well unaffected. Um, that narrow shape helps them um, kind of keep a low profile and shed a lot of that snow in, in pretty quickly, or uh, it just means that they don't have these big, long, heavy branches that can get really inundated with snow and just snap right off. Um, so these trees really are built for the winter, um, which is a really amazing thing. This black spruce is one of the more northerly and widely distributed forests or uh, trees in the forest, in the boreal forest. Um, and so it's, it's lovely to see them covered in snow because um, they really don't bend and break um, like a lot of other species might. Um, and there are other things that are adapted to the snow as well, but maybe we don't think about them until the summertime happens. Um, this is uh, leather leaf, and if you can see, um, the leaves are still reddish, right? They're not green. A lot of the plants you find in the bog, especially those specialists, um, are adapted to the cold. They're adapted to the dry conditions that we have in the winter, but also towards the end of summer. Um, and they don't drop their leaves. They keep them all season. Um, they kind of wake back up with the warming in May, and then they start to flower right away. Um, and so they're really well adapted to having this really elongated cold that we do see in northern Minnesota. Um, and this is just one of those plants that also has to deal with growing in a bog, which is not very easy. And so there's some adaptations from the plants that I don't think we think about a lot. 
Uh, mammals certainly have adaptations that we think about. Uh, we are mammals and we just put on coats and boots and hats and hand warmers and then we're ready to go. Uh, but snowshoe hares are here all the time. So they need to adapt to warm and wet and cold and dry. Um, in the summer, um, they look like this, they're brown. Um, they can blend in with the bogs and um, the ecosystem that they're found in. They're also very good swimmers. So if they have to cross some water, no problem for them. Um, but this is what they look like in the winter, uh, a very different critter, right? Um, and a critter that if they stayed brown uh, would become an easy target for things like bobcats or goshawks, uh, great horned owls, um, a very easy thing to see. Um, so they blend in to keep the predators kind of at bay. Uh, but of course they have another adaptation, right? Their big feet, um, snowshoe hair for a reason. Um, those feet allow them to cruise over the top of the snow without putting in too much effort. And one thing you'll notice if you look at mammals in the northern forests, um, a lot of them have really big feet. Snowshoe hares, lynx, even moose, uh, gray wolf, they all have really big feet because they have to adapt to maybe squishy, wet, marshy conditions, but also snowy conditions. Uh, and if you are expending a lot of effort in the winter as a mammal and you might not have a lot of abundant food sources anymore, um, that's not good. <laughs> and so they have these adaptations to help them survive. Um, but so do birds. Uh, this is a rough grouse. Uh, rough grouse have a cool set of adaptations, um, a, a suite of adaptations to help them get along in the winter time. Um, they also get bigger feet. Um, uh, rough grouse grow kind of fleshy projections off their toes called pectinations um, that help them sort of stay above the snow as they're walking. Spruce grouse, um, the ptarmigan, sharp-tailed grouse, uh, all of them grow really heavily feathered feet so their their feet become almost fully feathered um, so they can kind of walk along the surface of the snow at least in the case of ptarmigan and with the our grouse our sharp tails um, but adaptation there but the really cool adaptation that these things have is this is snow roosting uh rough grouse snow roost uh very regularly uh, a lot of our grouse do sharp tailed grouse do it rough grouse do it i'm sure spruce grouse do it um, because it's a way to insulate. It's a way to control your metabolic needs in the winter. Um, snow is really highly insulatory. Um, and if you go all the way down to the bottom of the snowpack, you end up to a layer um, called the subnivian zone, which is the layer just above the ground that stays a pretty constant 32 degrees all winter long. As long as there's snow insulating it, it won't really dip below 32 degrees. And so if you're a grouse, you can burrow your way down into the snow, you're going to be insulated against 30 and 40 below, which can be a real challenge to, to be uh, moving around in. Uh, and so they are pretty inactive during the day. So when you come visit the bog, if you're looking for grouse, typically you're going to have to look for grouse in the morning or in at dusk. They're pretty much not going to be active during the day. Um, their activity levels uh, are pretty low. They're, they're under the snow maybe 18 to 20 hours a day, um, taking advantage of sort of stability in the dawn and the dusk periods from at least finding or predators avoiding them um, and, and taking advantage of food before they're dipping down into the snow and staying insulated. Um, and you can find those places if you see towards the top of your screen there. Um, that's a place, uh, these two holes in the ground were both places where grouse got out of the snow and, and kind of walked to their next area, uh, their next foraging area, which is a really cool find um, on the snowshoe hike. Uh, but like I said, uh, they're really active at dawn and dusk. Um, it's maybe a little more stable for them. It also keeps them out of the reach of predators. Um, a lot of the things that are eating rough grouse are active during the day. So if they're not active during the day, um, they really do need to take advantage of the dawn and dusk periods. And they absolutely do. Getting up into birches um, and alders and eating those catkins, those really seed heavy, seed dense um, packets um, that those trees and shrubs produce. Uh, but another bird that has a whole kind of crazy slew of adaptations is, is common red pole. Um, this is an absolutely amazing bird if you think about it biologically. They're really cool to look at. They're wonderful when we do get them during the winter. Um, right now, there's not a ton of them around because there's plenty of food up north. So this is a bird that is pretty highly eruptive into our area, um, which means they're moving south because they don't have as much food north. Um, this winter doesn't seem to be the case, but um, this is a bird that in the winter, um, or kind of before the winter, adds uh, by weight about 30% more feathers 
Um, so they physically prepare themselves by growing more feathers um, to help them winter the, uh, uh, overtake the cold. Um, they will also snow roost, just like grouse do. Um, it's something that a few species of bird do, but especially Arctic species, these far northern breeders, um, they, they will take advantage of that insulating, uh, the insulating properties of the snow. Um, but the other weird thing that red poles do um, is they're active or they, they become really active towards dusk. Um, and so they'll feed and they'll feed, 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 and they'll store a bunch of seeds in their crop. Um, so then when they sleep, they can periodically wake up and process the food in their crop and keep their metabolisms running all night long. And so they're really well adapted to the cold that way. Um, some of our birds will dip into torpor. Um, certainly sometimes red poles might need to do that. Black capped chickadees do that up here where they will just sort of shut down um, through the winter uh, or through the night. And then they'll kind of wake themselves back up in response to really super, super cold. So um, there's a couple of different ways that, that birds um, can uh, adapt to really extreme, extreme colds like we see sometimes uh, in the bog. So this isn't a bird, and I said we'd talk a little bit about birds, but this is a really important little critter to think about. Um, when we think about fuel, right? If you're gonna be active in the cold, you need to be warm. Um, and so unfortunately, our, our dear friends, the, the Southern Redback Vole, um, they are really the fuel source for a lot of species. Um, if we run down the list, rough-legged hawks. Um, the Saxon bog is a really important um, migratory stopover habitat for rough-legged hawks in the fall and in the spring. Um, they'll also use it all winter in some cases. And part of the reason they can do that is because there is food, right? There are voles and there's abundance of voles. Um, Rough-legged hawks are very specialized uh, small rodent eaters. Their feet are really, really small. Their bills are really, really small compared to a, a red-tailed hawk. Um, you know, their feet are maybe half the size of a red tail, but they're just as big as a red tail um, because they're, they're, they're rodent eaters. Um, and so having a lot of rodents is great. Having open fields is great, um, but they are a bog breeder. They're a northern kind of above the tree line tundra bird. And so they're very used to the, the habitats that are in the Saxon bog. And we do get them overwintering um, pretty regularly. Uh, but our owls are maybe the biggest um, kind of predator of these these little critters. Um, if we think about great grays, uh, great gray owl eats almost entirely voles in our part of the world. Uh, in the, the boreal forest, the northern parts of its range, it's going to be eating uh, basically two species of vole um, almost all the time. In the summer, it's southern redback vole. In the winter, it's meadow vole. Um, and that's the thing that they're eating. Again, adapted with really small little feet. Um, they are a very big bird. They are our largest owl by, by height in North America, um, but they are very, very small in their bodies. They're mostly feathers, so they're really well adapted to the cold. Um, they're really well adapted to that silent flight that helps them catch things. Um, but these voles kind of influence whether or not we see owls. So this is a northern hawk owl. Um, we'll typically get a northern hawk owl in the bog in the winter, Sometimes a lot of them, sometimes very few. This winter has not been a great winter for Northern Hawk Owl. Last winter was not a great winter for Northern Hawk Owl, um, which probably means their food up north is doing just fine, um, which is just great. We want those birds to succeed. It's a bummer if we don't get to see them, but we really want them to succeed no matter where they are. Um, but those vole populations also influence the populations of these owls. Um, they all cycle. So uh, Northern Hawk Owl, Great Gray Owl, Boreal Owl, to uh, uh, some extent, northern sawwood owl, all have cyclic population booms and busts based on uh, vole populations. Sometimes it's really easy and clean to predict. Uh, in the case of boreal owl, uh, it's really every four years you get movements and eruptions from those birds. With hawk owls, it's a little harder to say if it's six years, maybe it's eight years, um, or maybe they're just nomads and they don't really erupt at all. Um, and then great grays, again, pretty hard to, to, to nail down if it's eight or 12, or maybe it's just four. Um, it, it's all dependent on those, those rodents, though. And without them, this ecosystem really wouldn't function. Um, voles are incredibly important um, to uh, this ecosystem, whether it's tunneling and that's allowing air to get in, which allows uh, organic material to break down, um, whether they're a food source to a number of different species, um, or whether it's their poop that's giving a nutrient up uptick to some of these places that are fairly nutrient poor, um, like a lot of bogs are. 
Uh, but those voles are also food to mammals, too. We shouldn't uh, forget about our mammals in the bog, especially our weasels. Um, we're lucky to have a lot of weasel diversity in the Saxon bog. And again, part of the reason is because there's abundant food sources for them through voles. Uh, this is a pine marten uh, or American marten, um, as, as it is now. Um, and they're pretty uh, a pretty charismatic critter. Um, if you've been up and you've spent some time looking for martens, um, you have a non-zero chance of seeing when you visit the bog. And, and again, part of that is because of those voles. Uh, so there's a lot of considerations to make for the winter if you're looking for birds or if you yourself are just trying to visit, right? Um, and so uh, I hope that's kind of a, a good background or a good sprinkling uh, of things that might get you excited to come see and, and come watch some of these critters do what they do at 30 below or 40 below um, if you're brave enough. Um, and so um, with that, again, I'll, I'll put out the reminder too that we have a lot of these same critters here all season, whether it's the winter, whether it's the summer. So the adaptations they have really have to span the seasons um, and span all sorts of weather conditions. And um, hopefully we can too. Hopefully we can get out and visit the bog in all the seasons because I think it is um, one of the, the really cool places that we've got here in the state, um, ecosystem-wise, habitat-wise, um, and of course, uh, bird-wise. Um, so with that, um, I'm ready to tackle some of these questions. Uh, I think we've got some time here yet for, for questions. And I'm going to leave up this last slide um, in case you wanted to, to dip out a little early. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions. I've got other information there, the social media side of things and um, the website, too, if you want to dig around and, and look at the information we have there. We've got a lot of good information on the, on the website, so um, do check it out if you haven't already. Um, but with that, I'm I'm ready for questions. If you guys are ready for questions. Yeah, we have some great questions here. Um, I can start with one that's related to winter. Um, what do you think the effect of warming due to climate change would be? And maybe if you could also elaborate on how that might impact like a bird's adaptations. Sure. Yeah. So uh, bogs and, and sort of the, the whole of the northern forest ecosystems are fairly climate sensitive. There's a lot of really specialized adaptations to cold, um, and sometimes we need the cold to help push back some things, right? If we think about uh, our native wood boring beetles, um, right now we've got a little bit of a, an issue with eastern larch beetle um, killing off tamarack in Minnesota, uh, and it's a native species, but it, it hasn't gotten cold enough to stop that bug, right? Um, it's certainly part of the ecosystem, but it, it can't go uncontrolled forever. Um, and so part of warming is those uh, beetles are having the ability to survive all winter, and they're also having the ability to um, put out two different broods in a season, which is a big problem for tamarack. Um, right now, about half the tamarack in Minnesota is dead um, from that beetle, which is a big problem. We think about bogs and lowland forests anyways. Um, but if we think about birds in particular, there's one species that we really need to think about. Um, well, maybe two, maybe three, but at least one um, being Canada jay. Uh, a lot of our corvids nest really early um, in the season, but Canada jays are starting to nest in February, just like ravens are. Um, but they've spent all winter and maybe the end of fall caching food. And so if we hit spans of warm weather, um, those caches of meat or, you know, bugs um, are going to end up spoiling and they can't feed their mates who don't really leave their nests at all. Um, which is a big problem. Um, if they leave the nest, those eggs freeze and then you don't have any more Canada Jays. Um, there's already been impacts seen in the Eastern part of the range of Canada Jay. Um, in Algonquin Provincial Park, there's been a lot of work done for the last almost 40 years on Canada Jays. Um, and they've noticed a pretty significant decrease of Canada Jays in that part of their range basically due to warming. Um, they're not able to maintain kind of their winter caches. And, and again, that's a big problem. Um, we could say the same about the forest changes impacting boreal chickadee. Um, that's a bird that we have a lot of in Minnesota because we've got a lot of good habitat, but if the habitat changes happen, we lose those birds um, and they just go further north to find the habitat if it's there. So um, yeah, definitely a concern in bogs and in Northern forests. Winter does have a lot to play um, with, you know, how some checks and balances get made in, in an ecosystem like this. And so without it, um, it can be a little bit of a problem for sure. 
So you touched on this a little bit actually in your answer just now, but um, one of our participants asks about invasive species in the bog and what kind of threats there might be to having an invasive species. Yeah, so the great thing about bogs uh, is that it's very difficult for invasive species to really gain a foothold. Um, outside of wetland invasive species, um, we really don't have much to worry about terrestrially uh, because they just simply can't grow in those bogs. Certainly there might be places that things could get in. Um, you know, we have buckthorn and, um, you know, tansy in some places, but not all over, which is really great. Um, certainly buckthorn is on the edges of bog, but it won't get in there because it just won't survive. Um, so we're in a kind of a good place there. Um, insect wise, it'd be interesting to see what could happen. Um, we are not quite knock on wood um, in emerald ash borer yet. Um, we have some emerald ash borer issues in Duluth and in Superior, um, but so far it's been very slow to creep further north and maybe part of that is because it does stay so cold, um, but we don't have any issues yet there in the bog. Um, so we're, we're kind of in a good place. This ecosystem is really highly specialized and so um, that means our non-native species or our potentially invasive species um, might not be able to really get much of a stronghold at all. Um, unless we see some disturbance and we see some big changes in that ecosystem. But um, as far as we're sitting right now, we're in pretty, we're in pretty good shape. I actually have a follow-up. When yep. I was in the blog, I didn't see any house sparrows and it seems like they can live anywhere. So why yeah. wouldn't they be able to make a home in the bog? Yeah, great question. Uh, part of it is because it is so cold. Um, even in Duluth, we have we have house sparrows in Duluth, but um, they certainly get limited by how cold it is. If they can't find a place to stay warm, um, they're not going to survive. Um, pigeons are better adapted at that. Starlings are maybe a little better adapted. Um, but there are maybe two farms that have house sparrows, maybe three in the bog. So yeah, they really are hard to find. You really, you really, it really takes a lot for them to survive a winter. Um, and, you know, we're, we're luckily, we're pretty cold. Um, so yeah, they, they can't quite gain a foothold. Um, so we have a person who's curious about the Kestrel monitoring results. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I will I will point out one thing because that will give you more information. But down here, I noted the bog blog. Um, when we have kind of bio blitz wrap ups or, or bigger things there, um, head over there and, and you can learn way, way, way more. I've done reports uh, every year um, about the Kestrel monitoring program. So they're all up there. Um, very quickly though, um, it was a very good year, um, more or less records by a number of different metrics. Um, we had a record number of occupancies this year. Um, so we've got about uh, 50 boxes that are usable on the landscape. Um, and we had, oh boy, <laughs> summer was a long time ago. I think we were about 32 occupancies of that uh, 27 successful nests, I think. Again, uh, I will have accurate numbers in the bog blog, so go check that out. Um, but it was really good. We, we broke 400 kestrels banded uh, this season, so um, we're, we're adding more and more birds to the landscape, which is really lovely. Um, we were hoping that we would see more returns from some adult birds that we were banding and putting transmitters on. Um, we've been color banding all the chicks for the last two years. We've uh, been working with the DNR and a few other folks um, putting uh, radio transmitters and um, on adults. Uh, and so far we had one bird return. Um, and that was a bird that was color banded, but we, we weren't able to know if that bird had a transmitter uh, because some of the transmitters fell off. Um, a couple of, uh, of, of birds did at least. And so we're not sure who it was, but that was our first banded kestrel to return to any of our boxes, which was really exciting. So um, I'm looking really forward to seeing what we see next year now that we have two years worth of, of banded birds and or of, of color banded birds. Um, uh, and there's a whole project happening uh, or going on about kestrels in the bog uh, and in kind of the Midwestern part of their range right now. Um, Hallie Lambeau is working on her master's, um, getting a lot of data from us, a lot of data from folks in central Wisconsin and around the Twin Cities and in southern Wisconsin, um, trying to do some work on um, nesting success and some other metrics of these birds. So um, a lot of cool stuff happening. I'm, I'm super pumped that um, we're, we're to the point now with our data. 
um, where we've been under our present protocols for five years, where we're actually um, working on a paper about that right now too. So um, adding hopefully a little bit more about Kestrels to the um, knowledge base here um, in the next few years, certainly. Great question. And David asks, can you elaborate on the John C. Gale loop you mentioned? Was that donated in the memory of John Gale from Menominee, Wisconsin? Great question. Um, I'm not sure of the John Gale that it is uh, in honor of. Um, it is. Uh, it was a, a donation, and it was going to go in uh, to Yellow Belly Bog. Um, and then this year, Yellow Belly Bog was really, really wet, and so we said, "Well, let's put it to the Welcome Center because we wanted to build a boardwalk there for a, quite a while." Um, and so um, Jose Arrieta, I believe, was his name, uh, who donated some money for that project to get underway and and get um, basically almost finished. Um, we just ran out of wood. Um, more or less, which is a kind of a silly thing, but that's the way it goes sometimes uh, when you're building boardwalks. Um, so that will go from uh, kind of uh, the trails around the Welcome Center and it'll span all the way across that bog behind the Welcome Center to Gray J Way, um, which is really, really lovely. Um, and if you wanted to check in with me through the email, I can let you know if that is the the, the John Gale that, that you're noting is the one um, that the boardwalk is in honor of, because I don't necessarily know from, from my end. I just... Um, just have the name. Thanks for the question. And I believe you touched on this a little bit with um, the Great Gray Owl mm -hmm. eruption. Um, Manly asks when Saxon first became recognized as an area of interest for birders. And I don't know oh. if I mean um, like officially or just as a, a hub. Sure, yeah. So more or less, uh, right, folks who were birding in St. Louis County have sort of known about the bog for as long as people have been looking at birds out here. Um, but really in the 60s um, is when um, it kind of got more attention from birders, especially in greater Minnesota. Um, that was with the discovery of uh, basically a family group of northern hawk owls along Highway 7, um, which at the time was the first nesting record in, in the lower 48. Um, and so that was found along Highway 7, um, uh, there was a, a traveling preacher who um, was just also interested in birds and he was going from Duluth to the Iron Range um, and he saw one hawk owl and then he saw another one and then there were three or four more that popped out of the woods um, and that kind of got us, uh, you know, other folks really quite interested in, in the fact that, wow, if hawk owls are here, what else is here? Um, and it's grown since then. You can talk about people who've been birding there since the 70s. Um, and certainly folks beyond that too, but um, that was sort of the, the, the local birder um, kind of attention to the area was uh, kind of in the middle of the 60s there. Great question. And we still have a few more minutes for questions that people want to enter um, in the chat. We have a question about whether Friends of Sac Zims use um, controlled burns as a strategy to maintain habitat? Oh, great question. Um, at this point, no. Um, much of our sort of management is really kind of hands off. Um, the last couple of years, there has been more of a large scale land management plan um, that the board has been working on um, over the past, I don't know, three or four years now um, to make those considerations, right? Because we do want to be good stewards of this, this stuff. Um, the only really management that we've needed to do recently was uh, a few years ago at Warren Nelson Bog, um, when a lot of those trees blew down on the front side of that property, um, we did have folks come in and salvage log them um, to kind of pull it out and clean it up a little bit. Certainly dead trees part of a, an ecosystem, right? But um, when you have really kind of an artificial loss of those trees due to no trees surrounding them um, because of uh, foresting on the other side of the road, basically. Um, we had that come in and we've been replanting um, tamarack and black spruce there. Um, but burns for bogs are part of the story, right? Um, but not a huge, a huge important part of the story to um, uh, bogs, more or less, uh, if we were thinking about anything, it'd be water table stuff. That would be a bigger, um, a bigger management kind of need for a lot of the bogs um, in this part of the world. Um, certainly fires are fine, um, but definitely not something that we would be targeting necessarily, I don't think. Great question, though. 
So it looks like people are interested in uh, volunteering for the Castrol project and want to know how to get involved or other monitoring projects of different uh, sure. fauna that they could get involved with. Super. Uh, I love it. I, that's why I like doing some of these because you get the folks who are really interested in stuff. Um, so the easiest thing I can say is email me. Send me an email. Um, so there's my email right at the top, naturalist at saxzim.org. Um, that just makes me aware that you're interested in number one, just general volunteering. Number two, general generally interested in the Kestrel project. Um, I have had folks from the Twin Cities come up to monitor boxes before. Uh, we do it every 10 days or so. Um, you are assigned, uh, I think now we're up to eight boxes a person or a group. Um, and, and you go around and we have a training at the beginning of the season. Um, and it's a, a really fun group of folks. Um, so if you do have interest, um, I, I always seem to need a couple extra folks every single year, even though I've got a core group of folks who've been at it from the beginning, I, I always seem to need a couple more. So please do send me an email if you're interested in Kestrel stuff. Um, I'm not opposed to folks from the Twin Cities helping on that project because it, it's, you know, if you're able to do it, great. Um, other stuff, uh, last couple of years, at least two years ago, um, we did some bee monitoring stuff. Uh, for the Minnesota Bee Atlas, um, if you're interested, March 16th, it's a Thursday. Um, it's the last webinar of our season. Um, we're going to have Nicole come uh, from the Bee Lab to do a talk about the Bee Atlas generally, um, because we did a lot of fun stuff in the bog uh, with bees um, two years ago. But they've been trying to find volunteers to do more long-term monitoring, I think, uh, of certain things, whether that's visual surveys or surveying of boxes or, uh, you know, artificial nest kind of houses. Um, we haven't had that yet. I don't think I have enough volunteers up here who are interested in that. But if that's something that interests you, again, send me an email. Um, but we always are kind of very nebulous in our projects. So we might have one thing for a couple of years and then it stops and then we don't have anybody interested in anything for a while. So if you're interested, absolutely let me know. I'm, I'm happy to work through stuff to see if it's something we could do. Um, we definitely, you know, have master nats up here who are looking for projects all the time. Um, uh, and I'm happy to help facilitate some of those too. Um, it may be as simple as, um, you know, spreadsheet work with making sure I'm not duplicating any species on the species list. It might be um, going out and marking buckthorn or marking Canada thistle or tansy. Um, there's a lot of, of opportunities for stuff in the blog for sure. So um, if you're interested, that's great. Um, I would love to hear more about it. Do send me an email um, uh, about any and all of the volunteering questions you have. Um, I'm happy to take them. And it looks like people are curious about the evening gross beak research in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we just finished the webinar in December. Um, so that's up on our website. Again, there it is, saxim.org. Um, we've archived all the webinars from the speaker series for the last two years. So if you want to uh, learn more about that, feel free, head over to the website, head over to archived webinars under videos. Um, and you can learn about that. But to give you the, the quick of it, um, uh, we did have folks come from Pennsylvania last year um, to uh, try and transmitter some uh, evening grow speaks in the bog. Um, they were successful, um, not as successful as they wanted to be, but it did take them seven days to catch five birds. Um, so they learned a whole lot. We learned a whole lot. Uh, but they were able to put two satellite transmitters on um, two evening grow speaks from the same flock. Uh, those birds ended up in different places, which was totally an unexpected thing. One of the birds ended up in central uh, Manitoba, north central Manitoba. The other one ended up in almost east central Ontario, um, which is super weird. Nobody was expecting that level of dispersal from those birds. Um, and they did color band all of the birds that they caught. And there's at least two of those birds at the same spot this year. Um, as far as I know, I haven't been up to check on them yet, uh, but there's at least one that's been reported. Uh, and I think there's uh, at least two birds there that uh, uh, that have returned from last year, which is really cool. Um, for us, evening grow speaks do nest in Minnesota. They do nest in the bog, uh, but they're really hard to find during the breeding season. They're not very vocal in the breeding season, um, and they're, uh, they specialize on spruce budworm, which is a moth. Um, and so they typically focus on areas that have a lot of budworm. Um, and so we haven't had much issues with that in our area, um, but certainly in parts of northeastern Minnesota and, and further east, there's a lot of problems with budworm right now. 
Um, so it was great. It was really cool. They're planning on coming back. Um, David, at least, is is trying to get back here to ban some more because we have so many more gross beaks this year than last year. Um, we are on the western edge of the eruption that's happening in the east right now. And so we've got a flock of up to maybe 100 or more evening gross beaks at the Welcome Center. Um, the same could be said for the Sisu feeders. We've got probably close to 75 at uh, Yellow Bellied Bog this year. There's almost that many or more at Mary Lou's feeders. It's pretty amazing how many gross beaks there are right now. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's really an impressive thing um, to see if, you, if you're used to seeing a couple of evening gross beaks here and there. Um, seeing you know 75 to 80 pretty consistently is is pretty amazing so um yeah I, I really hope they can come because they they certainly should have some better luck this year at catching more than just seven birds uh yeah but thanks for asking and again you can find that video from david's talk on the bog website there under videos archived webinars um, great question and we've got a couple people curious about tamaracks Yep. Whether, uh, given the beetle situation, it's worth it to plant them. And then uh, the fact that uh, perhaps some tamaracks are dying in, uh, due to climate change, and if if that could be happening in, in Saxon as well. Good question. Uh, so the, the one thing that is understood so far, and again, uh, my knowledge of the whole status of it now, um, is a couple years old, um, but more or less we we in the Saxon bog are kind of on the east boundary of the biggest damage, um, and the beetles will only really kill trees of a certain size. So planting them is great because they they typically I think are using older trees. Um, I would have to check my notes um, on what size of tree they're using, but right now there's a lot of research in the bog going on. Um, with um, kind of creative forestry methodologies to make sure we don't lose all the trees, right? So can we selectively cut ages of trees? Can we just totally clear out a section and replant? Um, how can we do that? And that's through NRRI, the Natural Resources Research Institute in Duluth. Um, they're doing a lot of cool work um, in regards to Tamarack, both in Western Minnesota and in, in the Eastern part too. Uh, climate with tamaracks uh, certainly might have something to do, um, maybe not the whole reason because it is beetle damage that is killing a lot of these trees, um, but you know if your climate stressed as a tree you're going to be more susceptible to um, uh, you know ill effects from maybe a, a, a manageable infestation of beetles, um, and so that probably has a little bit to play with it, but I don't know if that research is out there yet to say for sure um, if climate is another uh, kind of adding factor to that, um, but definitely a consideration to make, um, um, certainly, but um, again, I'm excited to hear what NRI might have about some of that stuff. Um, so great question. I don't know if NRI's website has any information about it, but they very well could. Um, um, with the Natural Resources Research Institute in Duluth here. So we've got time for a couple more questions. What about woodpeckers in the winter time? Yeah. What about them? Uh, <laughs> this this area, uh, we basically have uh, the whole suite except for red-bellied woodpecker. So we've got downy hairy pileated. Um, we've got a pileated woodpecker right now, a male who's been at the Welcome Center and hanging out very un, unfazed by people, um, which is really cool um, for basically, you know, this whole season. Um, I saw him in October. He kind of showed up and has kind of been hanging around um, and uh, has figured out how to use all of the different suet feeders, has figured out how to use the carcasses, <laughs> has left the building alone, which is really great. Um, so those three. Um, pretty typical woodpeckers right but then we have blackback woodpeckers um all year round um this winter seems to be another difficult winter for them um there have been a couple of birds seen um but they haven't stayed in any one area for very long and that's pretty normal with blackback woodpecker um they are a very nomadic species and so they might move acres and acres and acres worth of trees before they find an area that they like and they'll stay in for a while um, and so for a couple of years, it was Warren Nelson bog. For a couple of years, it was Winterberry bog. Um, McDavitt Road had birds for a number of years, maybe 15 years. They had a couple of pairs working that road, and now they've seemingly moved on. Um, but that's sort of what they do. So it's been really difficult there. 
Uh, somebody just shared uh, there was an American three-toed woodpecker in the bog. I don't know when. I don't have any time on that or a location on that, but somebody did have one um, within the last week or so, um, which is really cool. Another bird that in Minnesota is pretty scarce as a breeder, but we do get them breeding in Minnesota. Um, I don't know if we've ever had any confirmations of them breeding in the bog, but we've definitely had birds linger into April. Uh, males and females together lingering into April. So potentially they, they've nested for us. Um, in the summer, we get our flickers back and we get yellow-bellied sapsuckers back. Um, uh, Red-bellied woodpecker for us is pretty rare. Um, last year, there were at least two, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, but that's a bird that's been expanding north for the last 25, 30 years. They got to Duluth maybe 15 years ago or, or, or maybe a little bit later. Um, so their population is growing and growing and growing. And so I would expect more of them. Uh, same thing with redheaded woodpecker. Um, last year we had um, at least four different red bellied or redheaded woodpeckers in the bog during the summer, which is unbelievable. That's a really high number for Northeastern Minnesota, but um, they have been nesting in rural Duluth um, and in kind of urban Duluth the last two years, there's been a pair that's nested in the same spot and there's been a pair um, just north of town that's been around and nesting. So potentially they might stick around the bog too. Um, so yeah, woodpeckers are great. We've got a lot of them. We've got a lot of nice habitat for them. Part of the reason we leave a lot of those trees down is because it's woodpecker habitat. Um, old trees are great for woodpeckers. Down trees are great for woodpeckers. Um, yeah, uh, it's lovely to have such diversity um, in, in a season uh, in the bog for sure. So we have time for one last question. Um, it's about birding etiquette in the bog and I'll just split that into birding etiquette towards birders and then maybe birding etiquette towards the birds. If you could speak to both of those. Sure, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it seems like every year we, we put out reminders uh, because things ramp up and then people are getting really comfortable and then uh, they don't remember that they're in a place that has other people, right? Um, and so uh, definitely <laughs> there are some considerations to make. We've thought about some of those considerations. Um, you can find them uh, on our maps. So if you download a map or if you pick up a map at the Welcome Center, you've got a couple of little notes. Um, most of it is please pull over far enough. Don't stop in the middle of the road. Um, you know, be be courteous to the folks that are with you because they may have come from hundreds and thousands of miles away to see a certain bird. So be respectful of, of their space and their interactions with that bird. Um, same thing with feeding stations. Um, we maintain different feeders in the bog. Um, we don't necessarily welcome other folks to do that except for the Admiral Road feeders, which we don't take care of. Um, it's more of a community-based feeder. Um, and so, you know, some of that stuff is, is is fairly straightforward. You know, don't walk in front of photographers or, you know, be loud, all those things, right? Um, towards birds, though, we do definitely want to be more, more considerate, especially when it's the winter time. And so um, when I'm leading groups or if I'm leading trips, I, I, I try to sort of explain a little bit why we might be so far away from some things, right? Um, we can certainly approach birds if they're comfortable with us, but we don't want to be pushing birds at this time of year. Um, so, you know, we don't want to necessarily be chasing a bird down a road. We don't necessarily, even if it's accidental, right? We don't want to be pushing them to use more resources than they have. Um, uh, and so, yeah, we just want to be very, very comfortable around the birds, knowing that them don't really care about us. Um, chickadees, they don't really care what we're doing, right? They'll just bomb by our heads as we're standing by feeders. That doesn't bother them. Um, but for our, our raptors, especially, um, winter is really, really hard. And so we want to be extra careful when we're around those birds. Watch their behaviors. If they're getting a little agitated, don't get any closer to them and, and try to, you know, encourage that from other folks as well. Um, if you notice a bird's getting agitated, you know, maybe back back it up a couple of steps and 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 make sure that other folks know that, oh yeah, this bird is a little agitated. Maybe we need to, to back up. Um, luckily, a lot of these Arctic birds, a lot of these boreal forest species um, very rarely interact with people. And so they don't really know that we're a problem, um, which is great. <laughs> it also gets us as birders into a little bit of that tricky ground, right? We, we want to try to get as close as we can to some things and, um, you know, for better or worse, maybe we do. Um, and certainly some species are more tolerant of that. So it's just knowing the birds a little bit when you're out, you know, seeing what they're doing um, lets you kind of know what you can do as, as a way to approach them or, or to interact with them um, as well. But um, yeah, a, a lot of that common sense, you know, plays a big role. We're not pointing your 
binoculars at other people's houses unless they have said please do that um, that's always another good thing to remember in the bog there's not a lot of people that are feeding birds um, that don't want you there but there are definitely folks around that have bird feeders that are not interested necessarily in people viewing them so um, our map has it all marked out do use that map as a resource um, do use the website if you want to know where you might be able to go look for birds at certain feeding locations because um, we we put a lot of good thought and effort into a lot of our resources that we're sharing with you guys. So um, I think that's what what I'll cover for now. We could talk all day long about it, but um, we are we are approaching that eight thirty mark. So yes, we are, and thank you so much, Clinton, for that uh, wonderful talk. I learned so much. I do every time I. Uh, hear you talk about the bog and the birds. Um, I'm, I'm posting our calendar event um, in the chat. And I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us and especially to Clinton for uh, giving us his uh, time and expertise this evening. Uh, we will, uh, re we've recorded this program. We'll be posting it on our YouTube channel. You can uh, rewatch parts of it or share it with anyone you think might be interested. And we hope you can uh, circle back for our February program. We're gonna be heading back down to the cities uh, with an urban ecologist sharing his research on uh, conflicts between domestic cats and urban wildlife and how we can try to keep both of them safe from each other. So um, thank you very much and stay safe in the snow and let us know what you think uh, via email or any of our socials. Uh, thank you so much and have a great night. Thanks.